Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Today, my guest, investigative reporter Tom Robbins, and I want to introduce you to Judith Clark. She's been an inmate at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for 34 years. And we want to talk about the issues of crime and punishment, rehabilitation, and the power of clemency. Welcome. Thank you, Ronnie. Let's acknowledge first that that we both knew Judy Clark at different ways or have relationships with her. But also there are many people who deserve the same support and we're talking about a group of people for the clemency appeals. Folks like Judy who've been behind yeah. bars for many, many years yeah. for terrible crimes. Right. So I knew Judy because I knew her parents. Her parents were very good friends of our friends and neighbors. And when I knew them, they were like us, you know, a typical family living on West End Avenue the mother was a very important person in newspaper circulation, so Jimmy even knew her. And, um, and then all of a sudden, this happened. So it was quite shocking. And later, when I worked for Mario Cuomo, I went up to Bedford Hills, and I met Judy for the first time. I think she had just recently gotten there. So sort of sitting on the end of a bench, not looking at anybody, staring at the television. I told her that I knew her family, but she wasn't forthcoming at all. And then later, um, I've met her since, many years later. And the difference is astonishing. So uh, I just uh, can't imagine why she's still there. How did you meet her? Yeah, that's somewhat similar. I mean, I, I knew Judy through friends in Brooklyn in the 1970s. She was the former girlfriend of my best friend at the time, a guy who's now deceased. But, and I knew her to be this wonderful, laughing, with a great smile, you know, terrific person. But I also knew her to be this incredibly rigid, dogmatic radical. And she ran with this group of self-declared communists uh, who were, had allied themselves with people they thought were black revolutionaries. And whenever the subject would turn to politics, Judy's humor would disappear, and, and it was very difficult to deal with her. But... Yeah. Because her parents was, early on had been communists. I mean, and, and the father even was the foreign correspondent or something for the Daily Worker in and, Moscow. And then had given yeah. up his pension. And they was, gave it up. And right. she was, I think, trying to make up for her parents' lack of conviction. Right, yes, sort of right. And she always was that. involved in civil, in civil rights movement and uh, SDS. Uh, well, she was always, I think, eager to be more radical than anybody else. And so when I picked up the paper in October of 1981 and saw her picture on the front page about the Daily News and the New York Times having been arrested at the scene of this terrible crime where she and a group of her radical friends, both blacks and whites, had gone so-called to expropriate, as they called it in their ridiculous revolutionary jargon, this money from a Brinks armored car, a Brinks guard was grievously wounded, another guard was slain and killed at the scene, and then two cops, including the only black officer in Nyack, New York, was shot dead in a shootout with these bandits. Judy had been a getaway driver, it turned out, at the scene, and she got away, but then was captured within a few blocks and arrested, and she and a couple others stood trial. I remember thinking, I want nothing to do with this woman, that somebody that I knew who was friends with people I loved and adored, could I be so heedless of human life, to me was astonishing. And I didn't have anything to do with her for about 25 years until people kept coming to me and said, you should really go say hello to Judy because she's a different person. And after enough times of being told that, I finally went up to Bedford Hills and, and she was. That must have been quite a meeting. Yeah, well, Different you know, I, I wasn't convinced at first, you oh, know, yeah. re-encountering her, but after a couple of visits, I began to realize that this was not just someone who had recognized the error of her ways, but had grappled with the uh, serious issues that she had caused in a way that I'd never heard anybody do. I'm of the left, you know, mm -hmm. I know how people talk, and, mm -hmm. and, and she was the first person I heard really talk about how what she had done was fundamentally wrong, that the, that the deaths that resulted were a crime. She didn't talk about herself as a political prisoner, she talked about herself who had been motivated by politics, but who had committed the crime, and I found it quite remarkable. I ended up yeah. writing this it's article. This great piece for the cover of the New York Times Magazine section. Right. Four years ago, right? Right, back in, in 2012. Called yeah. Judith Clark. The, the radical the transformation, transformation of Judith Clark. Yeah. And it really is radical. Yeah. And she credits a lot of it to herself, but up to other people, too. I mean, uh, 
when she was in segregated housing for a different reason. She spent two years there. Right. And most importantly for her daughter, because she had a baby when she was living in that commune, right? When I went, to, I mean, one of the things I did when I started talking to her again was to ask her just what happened. And, and she describes how, how much, I mean, she was almost like an automaton. She was told that what we, all we need you to do is to drive a car, go to a certain spot, and then drive away. And without questioning, and she had just had a baby, and the baby was just almost a year old. And she fully convinced, she kissed her baby goodbye and got in the car and drove up to uh, Rockland County. And the next time she saw her baby, uh, she was behind bars, and she has not been able to live with her since then. So she's really an example of, some, of someone for whom prison was uh, almost, uh, I can't say a godsend, but an opportunity for her to really... Uh, reassess what she was doing in the world. Judy went through a lot of changes in prison. Yeah. Not, I think a lot of which she certainly would would have been less likely to undertake in the outside world. You know, yeah. she was compelled both to confront what the harm she had done. You know, as she says herself so eloquently. But she also got a chance to do good for others in a way. She worked when when she got to prison. AIDS was was a huge issue, mm -hmm. and she and her fellow uh, inmate Kathy Boudin helped start a. A uh, program that had fellow inmates help those who were suffering from AIDS. They yes. created a program that's been replicated All across the, the country, country yeah. in, in terms of dealing with that. She became a chaplain. Well, she got her degrees in college, which well, you she know, also. And, and she was there when they ended college yeah. assistance. You know, where there was right. no more government support for college, and so she helped convince a couple local colleges. Uh, to come into Bedford Hills Women's Prison and provide, which they still have to this and day. And which she, which she acknowledges was so important in her own development, right. college education. Right. And the most ironic one is that she does this puppies behind yeah. bars yeah. program, yeah. is that she trains dogs to act as service dogs now for vets of Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Iraq mm -hmm. who have gone through PTSD and, mm -hmm. and other problems. And she's a, a mentor to many of the women. They all love her, basically. And she also became a chaplain. But, you know... I went up there a couple months ago with a crew from the station, and um, let's play a, a tape we've excerpted from the interview so people could really meet her and better understand what she's doing. It takes us a long time to land. And some people, that means that they spend their first day, you know, years fighting or getting in trouble. And I didn't get into trouble until I got into big trouble. But I certainly, I just didn't really accept that this was what happened and why it happened um, for a long time. Uh, and eventually, I, um, because I was in communication with fugitives, I ended up um, in isolation in SHU. And my parents... Um, who were very worried about my daughter. So they were very angry at you. My father was the first person, when I was first arrested, he came to visit me in the county jail, and he screamed at me and screamed and screamed. He said, this is what you call a black revolution? I mean, he just, he, he screamed. And um, I know I was like, you know, I couldn't even like go near his anger. Um, but it stuck with me years later when I was willing to, really think about it and realize how right he was. Years mm -hmm. later, I'm, I told him before he died how grateful I was mm -hmm. that he came, that it was an act of love for him to come and scream at me. Mm -hmm. It's what I needed. Mm -hmm. And um, even though I couldn't let it in then, mm -hmm. eventually I let it in. So for you, the shoe, the segregated housing, uh, isolation, what right. do they call it now? Uh, right. Yeah. A number of things happened at the same time. One was my parents took me to court and took custody of Harriet. And I think for the first time it made me realize like that it broke me out of the illusion because the person that mattered most to me was no longer in my in the political commune. communal situation. And so I was forced to have to sort of step outside of it to begin to have a relationship to her and to rebuild a relationship to my parents. Um, and that was critical. And the other thing is that I was beginning to have a series of conversations with someone who um, was a sociologist with a psychological bent. She, was, she actually interviewed me, um, uh, a series of interviews. And um, her, uh, her name is Gilda Zwerman. And she, um, her questions were the first, I mean, it was the first time that I was talking to someone who thought my political ideas were ridiculous. I began to look at my experience. Um, so that also cracked me open. All of a sudden, these general 
statements, these abstract ideas, didn't hold water anymore. By the time I came out of shoe and two years later, I, um, I had stopped calling myself a political prisoner. That was the first thing. I'm like, I am, you know, a political prisoner implies either that you are innocent, I was not innocent, or that you justify the crime. And by then, I did not justify the crime. I recognized that three good men with families were killed for no good reason. There was nothing to reclaim it. And I didn't know what else I knew, but I knew that. So I stopped calling myself a political prisoner. And I, st and I had sort of decided that I wasn't even going to rethink my politics. I was trying to rebuild myself on much more personal terms. This prison for 20 years was um, headed by a warden named uh, Elaine Lord. You knew her well. Mm -hmm. And Lord was a remarkable, mm -hmm. remarkable um, corrections leader who, one, believed that women are different than men, which they are, <laughs> and two, that um, to manage prisons you have to recognize that they are communities where everyone who lives in them and works in them has to be invested in the community. It can't just be through brute force mm -hmm. that you force people to cooperate. And so she said, if there's problems here, you have to help us solve them. And she said, okay, you know, you're going to have to, I have to trust you, you know. So we said, well, we're going to let you know, we're going to write it all down, we're going to show you what we're doing, we're going to work with you in it. And so this, so here I was, you know, someone who had shifted to say, let's, let's find the common ground where we work together. And um, let's realize that it's not us and them, you know. And that in some ways became my, um, I don't know, my spiritual calling was to realize that in every situation that appears to be a conflict, there is some common humanity that you have to find and allow it to nurture. Because the choice is between that and devastation. One of the things when I said to myself, I have to figure out who I am, was that um, I started going to Jewish services. And my parents were very Jewish, but they were secular Jews. They were not religious. And I was not going to Jewish services to find religion. But I was going to sort of say, you know, I tried to join the black revolution. I'm not a black person, you know. Who am I? You know, and, and some of who I am it comes out of a history and, a, and an identity as a Jew. And that's really where I went. went. I think once I started going, I found, um, I, I found a context that helped me think about atonement. You know, in Judaism, there's a recognition that we do wrong and that the importance to recognize, to recognize you wrong and to try to repair the wrong. And um, uh, in Judaism, we call it teshuva. Um, most people call it atonement. And I, I think for me, it was very helpful because it was, it was concrete. It sort of said, first, you have to recognize that you've done wrong. Second, you have to apologize to those that you've harmed. Third, and you have to continue to do so, whether or not they, they accept that apology. And so part of that, to me, I had, harmed, I had harmed three families. You know, the people I had harmed the worst that I felt responsible for were no longer alive, but they were left with nine children who were growing up without their fathers and three widows and a community of people who had been devastated, other people had been. So that whole community I started to think of in very personal terms. Um, and ultimately I did publicly apologize. How do you do that? It's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, you can't, by regulations or right. law, you can't no. talk to them. Right. So I wrote a letter and it was um, printed in the Rockland Papers. You have to work on yourself so that you change enough that if you were put in the same situation again, you would do something different. Oh, that's interesting. And that to me, you know, when we talk about, you know, in, 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 in prison, people talk about remorse. And a lot of what remorse really turns into is guilt. But remorse is something else. Remorse is saying, I owe it to those who I have harmed to be better and do better and to make the changes I can make and to find ways to repair. If I can't repair, I can't bring back the lives that I lost. Mm -hmm. But I can certainly, you know, there have been generations of youngsters who have come in here and said, oh, well, you were down with the real thing. And I'm like, nope, I was a knucklehead just like you were. 
I just had a different rhetoric, you know, and beware when we think that we're so right that we don't have to think about who's at the other end of our anger. I am very fortunate to have been in a prison that did um, put meaning to rehabilitation. Um, and I think both my peers and many of the people who have worked in here would say it's a, that you, you can't, prison doesn't re rehabilitate people. People have to rehabilitate themselves. They have to take the opportunity. They have to. They have so the prison, time. Exactly. So prison has to create the opportunity for people to yeah. reinvent themselves. Yeah, it gives you the time to really think and do the whole thing. And, right? and in this instance, in this program, in this prison, it's, it gives you programs that allow you to do something better with yourself, not just in the sense of like, you know, there, there are, there's, you know, sort of therapeutic programs, but you can begin to, I mean, it's most women who do terrible things do it because of histories of trauma, because of terrible relationships they're in, because of addiction, and so, Having to, what rehabilitation is really about is reinvention, is being able to be the people that maybe they could have been if their lives had been different. Uh, I just was talking to someone who's at the end of 25 years. She has a 25 to life sentence. She's going to go to the board. Okay. And, you know, she said, I came in here 25 years old. She said, I spent my childbearing age here and leaving a menopausal woman. So I live with a lot of menopausal women. I live with women who have been inside for a really long time. I mean, when I first was here, there were long-termers who were here on drug crimes, but that's no longer true. When people say non-violent drug <laughs> charges, it's a little bit of an oxymoron because when if you speak to the women, I work with women who are here on nonviolent crimes in the, with short time on the nursery, but they will say that when they are in the throes of addiction, they are reckless and they are just lucky that they ended up getting arrested before they did something worse. Or they have experienced worse. They have been both victims of violence mm -hmm. and they have perpetrated violence. And there was a woman who is, um, was in my last group and she said, I was raised in a gang. You know, mm -hmm. my parents were identified mm -hmm. with the gang. Everyone I knew were identified with the gang. I never questioned fighting. She said, I took my child out of that situation because I'd rather, I, I want my child to know there's something different than that. And I now know there's something different than that. I live with the two women who, the three of us have been here the longest. Um, and um, they've actually been here, if I'm here 33 years, they've been here 36 years. Do we believe in interminable punishment, or do we believe that, um, that we should relook at someone down the road? Forgiveness. And if not, it's not forgiveness, even forgiveness, it's mercy. It's mercy. You know, when I, when, I, when I ask for clemency, I'm not asking for forgiveness. You know, first of all, you can't the forgive. governor can't forgive me, but he can apply mercy to looking at someone who has taken responsibility, who's tried to live a life that, um, that represents an understanding of what I did and what it means to try to change and um, in a sincere way. When women get angry and they're about to go and have an argument with an officer and get themselves in trouble and they say, I don't care, I would say those are the most dangerous words you can say because they're the words you say before you do harm to yourself or others. And they're a lie. You do care. Mm. That's why you're as angry as you are. I am not trying to take away your anger, but I'm saying recognize the heart that is feeling angry and allow that heart to stay open to everyone else around you, to everything around you. Everyone has to buy into the system. You, do I hate prison? Yes. But do I have a sense, a stake in my life in here? Yes. I do. Does that make me a more um, manageable prisoner? Yes. <laughs> Does it also give me the chance to become a better person, social person, social being? Absolutely. I think you have to live with hope. You know, I have to live with hope in order to be at my best. And some of my hope just comes from the day to day. I mean, I, you know, I have a new puppy and my puppy, you know, I have hope that I do good enough work with my puppy that she will end up going to a veteran as my last 
dog did. And, and I had the privilege of being able to be part of a team training program where the six veterans that were going to get our dogs came in and we taught them how oh, to good. do it. So you meet them. So we meet them and we train them. Oh. And to watch people who have sacrificed and come back deeply wounded mm -hmm. from Iraq and Afghanistan and see the changes that just two weeks with our dogs makes gives me hope in them, but also gives me hope in myself as, as, as being able to do that. But I also, you know, I, I, I have hope. I've been asking for clemency for six years, and I have hope that, um, that this discussion that's going on about endless sentencing can begin to look at um, looking at people as individuals. I have hope that if I went from seeing people in categories to seeing people as individuals, that, um, that our governor and our criminal si justice system can begin to do that. Not just for me, but for yeah, others as well. When I fight for clemency, I hope that I'm not the only one. So Tom, after our, my visit and your many visits, um, we can't help but ask ourselves, why is she still in prison? Right. And, and let's relate it to some other people who are in prison for a long time. What's the purpose of sending somebody per, to prison for 25 years? Yeah, we, we, it's funny, we, we call these institutions in New York State correctional facilities. And I would argue that if ever there was an example of someone for whom prison had turned to be a correctional, Judy Clark was one. And she's certainly not the only one. I think that that's happened to a lot of old termers. I mean, one of the phenomenons that people are talking more and more about is that folks age out of those people who've gone away for terrible violent crimes. They age out of being the risk to commit violent crimes again. I don't think anybody believes that Judy Clark would be a risk out on the streets. It's, I think it's hard to listen to her and see her and think that this is someone that the public needs to be protected from. And the, the issue really is what is prison for? And, and I think that 30 plus years behind bars for a crime for which she did not actually pull a trigger. And if she had done that, I, I, I don't know, I might feel differently about it if I thought that she was a shooter who had actually taken a human life. But she was someone who participated in the crime. She knew what was going on and she deserved a penalty. Uh, but I, I would argue that she's paid that, as have other folks. And one of, the, one of the things you hope is that after folks have turned their lives around, which I think Judy's a prime example of, that they get a chance to at least plead their case, which is something because of Judy's 75 to life term. She, their only out is clemency by the governor. The ironic part about it is the judge said at her trial, because she refused to participate in the trial, right? right. Sat downstairs, was very militant. Um, the, what did the judge say? You wrote that in your article. The judge said something to the effect that you'll never be able to live peacefully in the community. I don't think you'll ever be rehabilitated. Rehabilitated. So I'm sentencing you to 75 years. Right, right. It was triple life for three 25 to life terms for each three of the individuals who were killed. And at the time, it would probably be hard to argue with that, essentially, in terms of the way Judy behaved, as you said, at her trial, denouncing the right of the government to try her. But as she says, I think, pretty eloquently in, in these remarks, you know, this was something that she came to terms with, you know, that her enforced isolation from this closed-in, insular community. You know, when I met Judy, she was living in this commune with these folks, all of whom were true believers in the cause which she had embraced and who I think had largely abandoned their ability to be free thinkers in a way. Mm -hmm. as, as Judy says herself, mm -hmm. you know, she says like, you know, I was just sort of brainwashed. You know, I was going along with stuff. I stopped thinking for myself. You know, she didn't think of herself as a mother with a baby who needed to come back to. She thought of herself as someone who was an adherent for a cause and she was being delegated the task so she should do it. So the Judy Clark today, who's sitting now behind bars in, in Bedford Hills uh, for another 40 years under her term, I think is, it's wasted money for the taxpayers. But worse than that, it sends a message that no matter how much you do to fix yourself, we're still not going to let you out. And I think that's true for a lot more people than just Judy Clark. You know, one of the things she said is I asked her how she feels when other people get out. Right. And she said that the women are always happy, especially yeah. with a long-termer. Yeah. 
you're always happy when somebody gets out, and yeah. you, it gives you the hope that maybe someday you will. But you're right. I think that's one of the most remarkable things is you, when, the, when there were a larger number of clemencies going on, and usually they happened around the end of the year, yeah. between Christmas and New Year's, yeah. there'd be a huge celebration. And, yeah. and even though there was jealousy, why is she getting out and I'm not getting out, yeah. people felt it was validation of everyone's efforts to try to do right. And that's pretty much dried up. That's the encouragement and the hope that I think people need to live with when they're being kept behind bars. The other thing I loved was the, 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 the support of uh, community, I think, that most of the prison is, I don't know about the whole population, but when you get a degree, if you get your GED, yeah, right, or if you right, get right, your right. bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. the applause for that accomplishment, I mean, accomplishment is really appreciated within the prison population. I've been to those graduation ceremonies and the ear-splitting din of the applause and the whistles and the shouts is like Madison Square Garden when the Knicks are actually winning a game. You know, they're really, they're really appreciative. Do you find this kind of thing in the men's prison? Yeah, I think you find the same kind of hope. I mean, I think conditions, one of the things that, as Judy says here, was that she was in a way lucky to be in a facility in which she's had fairly enlightened leadership where they encourage mm. people to get involved in programs. Uh, the men's prisons that I've spent a lot of time in over the last couple of years, that's not always true. It's harder. There are stuff available, but it's harder, and the day-to-day -day living conditions are harder. But there are people who are in prison. Fifteen years to life seems to me 15 years a long time. Why can't we have some kind of an interim hearing on that sentence? In, or is that to push the parole up to... I, I don't know. I guess it gets complicated. You have to change the whole parole system. No, Judy's minimum is 75, so she's not entitled to see a to parole, parole board until she's done her minimum right. sentence. That's a minimum of 75 years. So, you know, there's a, there's a question. Many people who serve their minimum of 20 or 25, uh, you know, they go to a parole board and they get denied. They call it being hit, you know, and then they get like a two-year uh, It's a two-year term before term, they can go again. And then again. they can get, go back and go again and try to make... And one of the problems is that no matter how much people have done to try to improve themselves behind bars, they are often asked at the parole board, well, let's talk about your original crime again. And, you know, the crime is what it is. And as Judy eloquently says, you know, like what she did, there is no forgiveness for the crime that she did. No one should be expected to forgive her for what she did. The question is whether or not she's basically come to terms with it in a way and made herself enough of an ally for society that she deserves release. So she needs the clemency in order to be able to go to the parole board. That's what will happen the, the because governor she's could do not that. eligible to do that. Yeah. To me, look at her as a representative of this class of people. This is an era in which we're talking about mass incarceration in a serious way for the first time. Yeah. And if anybody, I think, is an emblem for, like, the excesses of mass incarceration, I think it's Judy Clark. There's so much more that we have to talk about the criminal justice system, and we're going to do it. Please join us again next week, and we'll continue our discussion.